Hello and welcome to Ember's Reading Room. Yes, this is a surprisingly long book of two-minute stories that aren't two minutes. Well, you have to have a lot of good content for the parents because the kid's going to ask them for a story. And you have to have multiple nights worth. Well, some kids may ask for the same story over and over. But still, you want to have a lot to choose from. So, continuing with my bedtime book of two-minute stories. Edited by Rosemary Garland. Illustrated by Tony Escott and Sally Wellman. Today's stories are The Race and The Taxi Drive, both of which are by Rosemary Bromley. Ooh, yeah. double headers. I like those. Well, I actually, I like the whole book, but it's always fun to say. The Race. My name is Queen Mab, and I live in a fine pigeon loft with lots of other racing pigeons. We belong to Mr. Mick, and we think he is the best pigeon fancier in the whole world. No matter where we may be, we do our best to fly home to him as quickly as possible, for no one else could care for us as he does. Our loft has every comfort, and Mr. Mick's dog sleeps in a kennel by our house. The other day, I was sitting on a perch in the garden when Mr. Mick came out. I flew onto his shoulder. Hello, he said, and how is my champion this morning? Are you going to win the big race all the way home from France? I'll do my best, I cooed. The next morning, Mr. Mick took me along to his pigeon racing club. He held me gently while another man wrote down the number that is stamped on the little metal ring I wear on my leg. Now we'll put your race ring on, said the man. Then into the basket you'll go. There were several other pigeons I knew in the traveling basket. Soon all the other pigeons who were racing from France with us were safely in their baskets and we were loaded onto a van. We're off, cried the van driver. We shall soon be on the Channel Ferry. Goodbye, good luck, Mr. Mick called. I get very sleepy on these long journeys, and I would want all my strength for the flight home, so I slept most of the time as we drove across France. I woke up with a start when the pigeon next to me gave me a friendly peck. Wake up, he said. I think we've arrived. I wonder where we are, I said to my friend. I heard a man say we were being set free in the mountains between France and Spain, he replied. What a long way from home, I thought. I wish they'd hurry up. It wasn't long before each of our basket doors were opened and we all flew out. There were hundreds and hundreds of us, and I expect we looked just like a gray cloud. How good it was to be free and to have the whole blue sky to ourselves. But already I was thinking of Mr. Mick and Rusty in our pigeon loft. Cheerio, I called to my friend. I'm off. On through the snow-capped mountains I flew, and as the sun faded, I saw a great black cloud coming up all around me. Then there was a loud bang and a flash of light across the sky, and down came the rain. I was blown all over the place, I can tell you. As I left the mountains, the storm died away, and when daylight came, I saw I was flying over green wooded country, silvery rivers, and old castles. Then I lost count of time until a cheeky starling flew by. Going to see the sights of Paris, he squawked. There's some good perches on the Eiffel Tower. No, I'm not, I said crossly. I'm going home. But I looked down, all the same, and there below me was the tallest tower I've ever seen, and the city spread around it looked very inviting. But I flew on, and when I saw the busy port with the big ships and the bustling little tugs, I knew I was not far from home. The sun was setting as I flew over Mr. Mick's bungalow and onto the landing board of our loft. And there was Mr. Mick and Rusty, waiting for me. There's Queen Mab! There's my champion! he shouted. How happy I was to be safely home. I was so tired that I fell asleep right away. That was a week ago. Mr. Mick has just come out into the garden. You've won! You've won! he shouted. You really are a champion, Queen Mab! Fun little story, and the art is, it's kind of, it's the color art again, but the way the brushing and texturing is like a little different than the other images this artist has done before, unless they've flipped artists, because we still don't know who does what in this book. We just know there's two artists, and they've worked in this book, so who says that they couldn't flip from style to style? Or even trade back and forth from color to the more monotone drawings even though there seems to be more consistency across with the color types it's just the way that the strokes and stuff looks on the feathers and the way the colors it's almost like 
It's a watercolor again. That's what's going on. And we haven't seen that type from the color artist in a while. I wish they would have given individual page credit. I mean, the authors get credit for each one. Yeah, it would have been nice to like see a signature in the bottom corner of one of these drawings so you at least know who's who. Also, I'd like to know who wrote the poems. Yeah, because it doesn't necessarily mean that the person whose story is on the page is the same person who wrote the poem and there's no specific credit for the poems but the texturing and stuff like that is really nicely done and it just threw me off for a second like oh i think it's watercolor the way the pigeons are rendered or it's really nice and the detail in this drawing with a with a queen tab mm -hmm. sitting on what looks to be a perch because it's not colored correctly to be an arm and you can actually see the detail of the little metal bracelet with the number on it. You can't see the number, but you can see the little metal bracelet. And then you get this picture here of the snowstorm. And of Queen Mab over the Eiffel Tower. Oh, very nicely done. You can see the detail in the buildings and everything, too. A lot of detail in these three images. And this is one that probably wouldn't have interested me much as a kid. But when I was in high school, I had a teacher who raised pigeons. Ah. And did a few of these competitions. I also like how the author like assumed like the pigeon really liked doing this and like, oh, yeah, who knows what these pigeons think. We don't speak pigeon. No, we know that they come back, but are they coming back because, hey, that's where the food is, or are they coming back because they enjoy flying? I mean, if they enjoy flying, why are they coming home mm -hmm. and stay out and fly? But it's kind of the whole, the net that can catch the wind thing, because you're letting the birds go and trusting that they'll come back. Shall we go on to the next one? Mm -hmm. The Taxi Drive Bill, the London taxi, woke up one morning feeling ill and grumpy. Again with the self-aware <laughs> yeah. cars that aren't happy. <laughs> yeah, that just struck me right off the bat. Let's see, was Grumpy Bus by the same person? No, Grumpy Bus was by Margaret Connor. Hmm. So, across two different authors. Interesting. I don't think I shall go out today, he thought. My inside does not feel at all right. At that moment, Bill's driver, Tom, came into the garage. Good morning, Bill, he said. Time to go to work. He climbed into the driving seat and switched on the taxi's engine. Bill coughed, sputtered, and hiccuped into silence. Poor old fellow, muttered Tom. I wonder what's wrong. I must look under your hood. For several minutes, Tom worked away at Bill's engine, and gradually the taxi began to feel very much better. Now let's try again, said Tom, and this time when he switched on, Bill's engine purred smoothly. I think I will go out after all, the taxi murmured. Soon, in bright sunshine, Bill and Tom were on their way. What a lovely day. I am glad I came out, thought Bill. And in no time at all, Tom was driving through the gates of Waterloo Station to the mainline entrance. This is where they started work each day. My goodness, what a lot of customers there are this morning, cried Tom. Hold on, Bill. Let's stop at the top of the line. Here's our taxi, Mother. It's our turn now, cried a little boy as Bill drew up. So it is, Charles, replied his mother. Let's ask the taxi driver if he can help us. She smiled at Tom. We just arrived in London and have two hours to wait for our next train. My son has never been to London before. Could you... Take us to see some of the sights, please. Certainly, madam, replied Tom. Hooray, shouted Charles. Hooray, thought Bill. I am glad my engine feels better. What fun it will be. And it was the greatest fun for Charles and his mother, and for Tom and Bill, too. They admired the Thames from Westminster Bridge and waved to the boats beneath. They heard Big Ben strike the hour and were just in time to see the changing of the guard at Buckingham Palace. Charles nearly fell out of Bill's window with excitement when he saw the soldiers in their scarlet jackets and tall black fur hats marching smartly by. They gazed up at Nelson's Column in Trafalgar Square, laughed at the fountains sparkling in the sun, and at the hundreds of pigeons strutting about and tamely feeding out of people's hands. Tom said that if Bill was very clever in dodging the traffic, they would just have time to drive past St. Paul's Cathedral and into the city to the Tower of London. I'll be as quick as I can, promised Bill. And very soon they were admiring the great dome of St. Paul's. Then off they whisked through the narrow city streets to the Tower of London. 
The white tower looked grand against the blue sky, and Tom pointed out the famous ravens of the tower perched on the battlements. Do you know, said Tom, there's a story which says that if those great black birds ever leave the Tower of London, something terrible will happen, but they have never, ever flown away. Well, time to go back to Waterloo Station. With five minutes to spare, Bill pulled up at the main line entrance again. Charles' face was flushed with enjoyment as he clambered out. Thank you very much, he said. That was wonderful. I wish I could have spent all day with you in your taxi. So do I, said Tom. So do I, said Bill to himself, as they watched Charles and his mother disappear into the station. They crammed a lot into two hours. Yeah. Also, why did we need to start with the car not feeling up to it? Maybe these two stories are about, well, even if you don't feel like you could do anything that day, try pushing yourself a little bit and maybe you'll have a good day after all. Yeah, because I mean, that was like three paragraphs. Also, I think I'm going to use the changing of the guard image for the thumbnail of this one. Because it's very nice to get to see the mother, the boy, Bill the taxi, and two guards. Yeah, the only thing you're missing is Tom. And the only shop that Tom's in is the one where he's checking under Bill's engine. Hmm. Yeah, he looks more like a um, doctor at that point. Than a taxi driver. And considering that that's such a small portion of the story and the rest of the story is about seeing the sights of London. Also, this one with the guards is going to be one of the easiest ones to frame. Because the other one kind of makes an upside down J shape. Well, if I go for J's and I go for L's. Well, J and L are two different shapes in Tetris, so. Ah, very nice. So this has been yet another installment of my bedtime book of two minute stories. Edited by Rosemary Garland. Illustrated by Tony Escott and Sally Wellman. Today's stories were The Race and The Taxi Drive, both by Rosemary Bromley. Thanks for listening. This has been quite the journey. This is really the longest book we've tackled, but thankfully it's not a continuous storyline, so you can pick up and drop off anywhere you like. I uh, haven't picked up a copy of the book yet. Pretty sure we're still managing to find Amazon links for it. Still, the used is running about what this cost when my parents picked it up for me used uh, X number of years ago. Yeah. <laughs> In the year XX. What? <laughs> yeah, I love when they do like 19 XX. It's like, uh, wow, you really don't think your game's going to last very long, do you? <laughs> <laughs> but of course, now we get 20 XX and that lasts a little longer. Mm-hmm. All right, so yeah, like, subscribe, comment, lots of other entries in Ember's Reading Room, playlists, pop culture stuff on the main channel. Oh yeah, and the Ebates link, because shameless self-promotion, we don't get YouTube ad revenue anymore. Though YouTube stuff says we're still getting ad revenue for now, but it's probably going to disappear soon. Mainly because they say we don't get enough watch time. And, and subscribers. Yeah. <laughs> Though we love all of you, all 130 some odd of you. As especially those odd ones. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and quick disclaimer, Amazon and Ebates are not sponsors of or in any way affiliated with Ember's Reading Room or any content of the Lux Analysis channel. Thanks again for listening.